Hello, everyone. It's Jeff Urban here, back again on one of our Facebook Live Roosevelt uh, presentations. On behalf of our director, Paul Sparrow, and myself, I want to welcome you all to uh, today's program. Um, today, we're going to be talking about a small little group um, that is not very well known uh, that was part of the WPA, and um, we're going to talk and learn all about that. Now, during the pandemic, I have been reading a lot of the classics. And if there's one thing that Cinderella has taught me, it's that you have to have the right shoes for the job. And today, we're going to talk about people who, um, well, the right shoes for the job look like something like this. And something like this. I was always told you're supposed to hold the horseshoes up like that, otherwise the, the luck runs out. <clears throat> so today we're going to learn about um, a group called the Pack Horse Librarians. And um, in order to understand that, we have to understand a little bit about the Great Depression. Now, I know many of you are Roosevelt fans, so you probably know a lot about that, but there might be folks that are just tuning in for the first time ever. So the Great Depression, of course, was a unprecedented time of hardship in the United States and around the world. People forget that it was not just an American uh, depression, it was a worldwide economic depression. Unemployment here in the United States had reached on average 25% people out of work. Another 25% could only find part-time work. It was as high as 60% in some cases, in some places, in some industries. There were farm failures of about a thousand a month at the peak of the farm failure problem. There were bank failures uh, at the peak of about a thousand a month of uh, bank failures, also at the peak of the, the bank crisis. Factories were closed, people were losing their houses, people were losing um, their jobs, people were losing most of all their hope and their belief that things could get better. And one of the hardest hit areas of the country was the Appalachian uh, area um, uh, of the United States. Now, some people say Appalachian, some people say Appalachian. Um, I say Appalachian. So um, if you have a problem uh, with me saying it that way, then just you know write in the comments and I should say it the other way. Now, the uh, Appalachian uh, country was traditionally poor to begin with, and uh, conditions during the, uh, during the economic uh, downturn of the Great Depression made things even worse. Uh, many of these people were dirt farmers or they were coal miners, and um, the need for uh, dirt and the need for coal uh, went down quite a bit during the, um, the Great Depression, of course, because the factories weren't uh, um, you know, operating, so they didn't need uh, quite as much coal. And while much of the country was uh, suffering from 25% unemployment, the folks in this area of the country were suffering from 40% um, unemployment. And um, these folks had been barely making it to begin with, and you know the whammy of the, of the Great Depression really hit them hard. So Roosevelt's New Deal programs um, promised relief, uh, especially in the form of jobs, right? Uh, because a job not only gives you a paycheck, so you've got some money that you can now spend to you know, take care of your needs and also help to uh, stimulate the economy, but a job also gives you a purpose. It gives you a reason to get up in the morning. It gives you a sense of accomplishment uh, at the end of the day. And um, one of the most uh, important programs, really, of the, uh, the New Deal was uh, the famous WPA, right? The Works Progress Administration. And the Works Progress Administration is known um, you know, wide and far for its construction projects. You know, it built many, many um, hundreds and, and thousands, really, of bridges and roadways and, uh, you know, miles of sewer pipe and water pipe and parks and airports and seaports and all manner of, of infrastructure that the country uh, needed. In fact, 50 percent of the infrastructure in the country was created during uh, the Great Depression and largely by the WPA. Um, when the WPA uh, ran out of uh, folks that were, you know, looking for construction jobs or folks that had talent talents or interests in other areas, uh, they created Federal One, right? Um, hiring artists, uh, painters, musicians, actors, writers to um, produce works uh, for, the, uh, for the country, for the community, and they got paid uh, doing that as well. So most people know about the WPA uh, 
big construction projects, and a lot of people know about the Federal One projects, but very few people know about a little program called the Pack Course Librarians, and that's what we're going to talk about um, today. Now, the Pack Horse Librarians was a group of nearly a thousand women who delivered books and Bibles and other reading materials to an estimated 1.5 million people living primarily in the southeastern corner uh, of Kentucky between 1935 and 1943. And the idea for the program originated um, back in a place called Paintsville, Kentucky in 1913. There was a woman by the name of Mary Strafford and she was supported by a local coal baron uh, who had quite a bit of money, John C. C. Mayo. And um, she convinced him to uh, bankroll a sort of traveling library, right? Taking books out to folks um, in, the, in the countryside. And so uh, Mr. Mayo, John C. C., now imagine being so rich you can actually afford two middle initials. It must be nice. Uh, but Mr. Mayo uh, funded this. Um, from 1913 all the way on up until he died a year later in 1914. Um, you know, maybe just spend a little more time with an endowment and then, uh, you know, having the double initials. Anyway, a lack of roads uh, in the area and a lack of population centers, because these folks were, um, you know, largely uh, farmers um, and mountain people living out um you know, in the hinterland, meant that um, there wasn't a whole lot of, uh, of, of libraries, you know, there wasn't a critical mass to create uh, libraries out there. And the American Library Association estimated in 1936 that one third of the population of the country did not have access to um, a public library. Uh, and that was getting even worse, you know, given the, the conditions that were going on with the, um, the Great Depression. And the literacy rate um, in large parts of the country was, was uh, very, very low. And this was especially true <clears throat> in the Appalachian uh, area there as well. So the Paintsville plan um, provided a plan, but it was short lived and it, it only lasted um, just a little bit more than a year. But Elizabeth Fullerton of Leslie County, Kentucky, um, resurrected the idea um, and got a local minister to volunteer to supply his personal book supply um, as part of a traveling library um, uh, program if she could come up with some way to distribute these books. So the minister said, okay, you can use my book collection, you know, get it out there. It's not doing me any good sitting here. I can only read a book or two at a time. So let's get it out there to folks that need it. But you have to come up with a way uh, to do that. Now, the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, had been looking for ways to employ more women. And um, in fact, Eleanor Roosevelt, who is always an advocate for the underdog, um, and especially women uh, in this case, um, she was looking for a way to, um, to help them learn how to employ uh, more women. And she was a big advocate for this uh, particular program. So with her support and advocacy, public law uh, uh, S. 1517 was passed and the pack horse librarians became part of the WPA. Now, sometimes these pack horse women uh, were referred to as book women, uh, sometimes as book ladies, um, but we like to call them the pack horse uh, librarians. And these were women, many of whom were the only person in their family uh, making a living uh, at the time, um, were paid about $28 a month, $28 a month to deliver books along routes that were sometimes 18 or 20 miles per day. So let's take a look at um, what one of these ladies might have looked like. And here is a picture of a pack horse librarian. And you can see she is on the back of a horse and she's got her pack there. Now, sometimes um, the, uh, the books were carried in... Um, in wicker baskets, sometimes old suitcases, sometimes actual, you know, saddlebags, but more often than not, they were carried simply in old pillowcases because that's what the women happened to have. Now, um, these women were tough women, aged 25 to 35, generally speaking, and they were local women uh, of the area 
who um, had no opportunity for jobs. So they um, took to this pack horse librarian assignment, um, you know, quite readily and quite eagerly uh, as well. And it was important that they used local people because uh, many of the places they were visiting were way out in the hill country and um, folks out in those areas didn't take too kindly to, um, you know, what they often refer to as flatlanders. Uh, and so if you happen to have a local woman, uh, you know, who knew the area, who knew the ways, who knew the, the lang you know, the, the, the uh, slang and the lingo uh, and that sort of stuff, um, they were much more welcomed um, than strangers uh, would have been. So basically this roughly dollar a day, $28. And by the way, that $28 in today's money would be um, just over $500 a month uh, to, uh, you know, to be employed as one of these women. But roughly that dollar a day provided um, a payment from the government for the pack horse women. But that was it. Everything else had to come some other way, right? The funding was for, um, you know, payroll only. So the books, the papers, the horses, the administration, the bookkeeping, uh, laying out the routes, uh, the saddlebags, all the rest of that stuff had to be um, you know, generated um, in some other way. And very often it was simply just by the women creating these things themselves. Again, you know, driving around uh, on the back of a horse with a, um, you know, an old suitcase uh, loaded or an old uh, pillowcase, excuse me, uh, loaded up with, um, with books. Book drives were held to collect the books for the program. Um, they also collected magazines and pamphlets uh, and journals and periodicals. And um, these were all cataloged, repaired, and then organized for distribution uh, along the routes. Now, one of the most popular um, uh, books that was uh, passed around through these uh, pack horse librarians was actually the Bible. Um, the Bible was one of the most popular uh, books that was always being re requested. Um, and part of that was because uh, the folks out in the hinterland were familiar with the Bible passages and many of them couldn't read. So, um, you know, when the uh, pack horse librarian would sometimes, uh, you know, show up at the property, um, they might be reciting Bible verses um, and, you know, showing and holding up the Bible. And, um, you know, that made them more, um, you know, welcomed uh, by the people there. Uh, these folks also were not folks who tended to be able to get into town to go to church. So they depended on these Bibles for um, inspiration, for the wonderful stories, the wonderful illustrations. If they couldn't read or couldn't read very well, there was beautiful illustrations in some of these older Bibles. Um, and of course, they also learned, uh, uh, leaned on them to uh, have lessons for uh, Sunday schools um, as well. Now, the program was set up around what was called monthly conferences. So uh, once the, um, uh, the area, you know, your particular county decided to uh, create a pack horse library uh, program, there would be um, an administrator who would be selected and um, <clears throat> that person would then create what they called uh, conferences. And um, they would meet uh, at a library in town if there happened to be one or at someone's home or the back room of a general store. And um, this person would act as a, as a clerk. They would um, oversee the, the uh, collection of donations of books that were brought in. They would then repair the books so that um, you know they could be if they were in, in rough shape. And many of the books that were actually on these routes came up and came back in very rough shape, right? Because they're being traveled by horseback, um, you know, eighteen or twenty miles a, a day. And um, so they would. Uh, their, her job uh, was to uh, collect the donations, take an inventory of the books take a look at the books and, um, you know, repair ones that needed to, uh, to be repaired. And then there was also her responsibility to, um, to create bookmarks for each of the books. Every book went out with a bookmark and these bookmarks um, were made out of things like old Christmas cards or maybe a seed catalog or maybe, um, uh, a piece of wallpaper, something like that. And these bookmarks were really, really important. Every single book had to have one because these bookmarks extended the life of the books because this way people weren't folding down the corner. You know how people dog 
dog ear the corner of a book when they um, you know when they read it. Um, well, you do that a couple of times, and what's going to happen is that book is going to deteriorate. And um, I hate when people do that. You know, when I lend my books to people uh, and they come back and they've done that, you know, they folded it over. Uh, it drives me nuts. The only thing worse than that is when you lend a book to somebody who not only uh, likes to fold over the uh, the corner of the book, but is also um, into uh, origami. Right, then the book comes back looking like this, and it's really hard uh, to, to read you know, books when they've got origami poking out of them. The clerks used scrap paper um, and um, empty cheese boxes. So this was their card catalog. It would be nothing more than an empty cheese box. They would uh, file the books uh, here uh, under different categories. They had their pencils back here. Um, and then as new books would come in, they would fill out a little card for them, place them into the uh, into the appropriate place in the um, in the catalog, and this is how they kept record of what books were going out, what books were going out on what route, what books that they had, and the condition of the books, um, you know, as they were uh, going through their life cycle uh, in the um, the Pack Horse Librarian program. So imagine, you know, you're getting paid to do this, right? That's that's where the money's coming from for for pay payroll, but all the other equipment, you got to make do the best way um, that you possibly can. When a book or a periodical um, became too worn to circulate, then it would be cut up and made into um, a scrapbook. And the scrapbooks were then used, um, were, uh, you know, used on, on routes and they would go out uh, as well. And um, it was, again, that, that, that clerk back at the, uh, the conference uh, who would be responsible for making sure that those um, scrapbooks were, were put together. So let's take a look at what a typical scrapbook might look like. It might look something like this. So it's nothing more than, you know, a, an old binder. And, um, you know, you have your uh, pictures cut out of magazines and things um, put on here. And then, you know, whatever happened to be, this is uh, uh, Harlan County uh, Pack Horse Library. Uh, this is what was going on the Harlan County routes. And, um, you know, it would give you where they were uh, going to go in these ways. Pictures were really important because a lot of these folks could not read or couldn't read well. And so if you had the picture, they could figure out, you know, um, the, what the words were by the context of what the picture was. Um, and a lot of times the children who were actually attending, you know, school as best they could, given the Great Depression and the, you know, the conditions out in, in that area of the country, um, the children did have uh, oftentimes better learning and reading skills than the parents did. So the parents um, were able to be read to by the children. And this increased the ability of the children to read really well. So inside this, um, again, you're going to find, you know, how it's laid out. Um, you're going to find a lot of, this was very popular, uh, recipes, what's cooking. So they would take uh, recipes out of cookbooks that had become uh, worn or um, no longer able to be passed around. They would cut out uh, the parts that still worked. And then they would also, um, you know, type up other uh, recipes and things along the way. That was very, very popular because um, it gave people new ideas on what to do with what they had uh, out there. Also very important were fashion. Uh, fashion. Now, of course, you know, you're not going to be wearing outfits like this out in Appalachia, but it's kind of fun to look at people who are, right? I mean, look how fancy these folks are, you know, look how fancy these folks are. So, you know, fancy dresses and the kinds of things that city folks were wearing were also very important to the folks uh, out there in that part of the country. And sometimes they would even have, um, you know, rudimentary uh, designs and things for dresses and such uh, as well. And I love this. This is a little thing here. It says, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. Um, and that was a very popular saying back during the Great Depression. Um, whenever we visited my grandma's house as a kid, my grandma had this on her wall, uh, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do it out because she had come from the Great Depression. So I, I took this um, from my grandma's house. My, my wife says I should have asked, but um, I don't think she's going to mind. So that was the, that was the, 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 the mantra, right? Use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. Um, if a magazine had become too worn, um, then what you would do is they would just cut those piece, pieces out and would put it in here uh, into the scrapbook as well. Um, so you've got magazine articles. Here's a nice picture, right? So even if you can't 
read, um, you can make up a story about this picture. And again, this is a great way to spur imagination. It's a great way to, um, you know, spur family time, right? Story time, that sort of stuff. And it's a great way to take your mind off how bad things are um, during uh, the Great Depression. So these are the kinds of things. I want to share with you two of my favorite recipes. Um, and again, sometimes people would write and draw little comics in there and stuff as, as well. Um, and this has been work until the cow comes home. But let me share with you um, two of my favorite recipes. And um, I will show you these in just a second. The first one is for, <clears throat> and it's too bad we, you know, this is going on at two o'clock because you've already had lunch. You could have whipped this up. But the first is called baked groundhog. And what you do is you parboil your groundhog, hopefully fresh, um, until it's tender. Then you get spice wood switches and lay them under and over this groundhog and you place it in the oven and bake. Okay, and then find yourself a book or something to read because you're not going to be able to take your mind off those delicious smells coming from that baked groundhog. Um, another one is um, uh, baked opossum. Okay, so if groundhog isn't your, isn't your flavor, uh, opossum may be. Baked opossum. First, dress the opossum, okay, uh, and stew until tender. Then place small twigs or limbs of spice wood in pan with opossum to flavor. Add pepper, lard, salt, and bake. And then just wait to enjoy. Now, I'm not kidding. These were real live recipes um, that were sent out uh, and are about and around to people. So you can you can see that. If you, if you like, we could probably put these recipes online on our uh, website so you can you know, if you, if you didn't get all the steps and the ingredients and such. But these scrapbooks, really, really important because it made the wear and tear on the books still usable by creating the scrapbooks and getting those things out uh, into circulation um, as well. Now, what other things might you find in the, uh, the pack of a pack horse librarian? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's take a look and see what we can find in there. Uh, what do we got here? So... We have some fancy magazines, right? And again, the idea of, um, you know, uh, fashion, you know, how fancy people are living, you know, that sort of stuff. Great ways to provide entertainment. The American Magazine, okay? Uh, so you can get a sense of what the spiffy golfer was wearing around about 1935, uh, uh, 36, 37 or so. National Geographic Magazine, Okay. These were very popular because the articles in here contained information that would never really go bad, right? So, um, you know, this could be circulating around for years. And if it's talking about the migration of this particular bird, that's not going to change from year to year, right? So um, this could be sent out on all the various routes over the course of, um, you know, the, the Pack Horse Librarian area. Um, and um, the information would still seem, um, you know, pretty pretty up to date and such. Of course, the Bible, right? As we said, one of the most important books um, being passed around uh, out there, um, you know, for inspiration, for comfort, and also for um, the idea of, of Sunday school lessons uh, as well. Also um, very important uh, in the uh, circulation were uh, books that would appeal to children. So classics like Treasure Island, all right, nice colorful covers and nice easy reading once you get in uh, inside there. Um, you might find a spy in Williamsburg, right? So you can, you know, have a little mystery uh, going on there around the fireplace um, at night. Uh, the kids especially loved Robin Hood, right? You know, all his adventures, uh, stealing from the rich, giving to the poor. Hmm, interesting idea during the Great Depression. Uh, and so what you've got here is the old classic Robin Hood going on there as well. You also would find um, things like uh, Hansel and Gretel, right? A good old-fashioned classic um, that, you know, the kids would love to, to hear about. And again, it tells you the, you know, the story, the moral of, you know, not trusting outsiders, right? That witch. Uh, you also might find books that were useful uh, for you on the farm, you know, how to maintain your kerosene uh, lamps, uh, if you happen to have kerosene lamps out there on the farm uh, as well. And then, of course, you know, other classics like uh, Alice uh, in Wonderland um, as well. 
So at the monthly conferences, these donations were cataloged, uh, put in uh, in order, and um, the books were repaired, the bookmarks were assigned, and then the ladies were given their assignments uh, to head out uh, along the way. And here is a group of women who are heading out up a dried stream bed. Now, the way this worked, ladies and gentlemen, is that these women were going out and they were delivering these books, these reading materials, way out in the hinterland. There were no interstate highways at the time. There were no even state highways, uh, generally speaking. And if there were, they generally tended to be uh, dirt roadways, um, you know, not the, you know, the pavement kind of roadways that we have today. So what we have here is a group of women who are working their way um, up a creek. And when they get to a certain point, they'll peel off and they'll each take a different route uh, to a different group uh, of people up there along the way. These women used dried creek beds, or in this case, um, there's still some water in there, uh, to travel. Um, they would use um, animal paths. So if there were paths through the woods, or through the fields where, you know, uh, deer or, you know, foxes or those kind of animals, um, you know, had tended to make paths. It was easier for a horse to get through that way. They would use that. Very often they would just uh, travel along fence lines, um, you know, and, uh, and move from place to place um, that way um, as well. The, uh, the routes were laid out uh, at the conference and um, great care was taken to make sure that um, the books that people were requesting were put onto those uh, particular routes. And this way they were able to get a larger circulation uh, of the books because um, what you could do is you would have certain books that would go out on one route and then you would bring them in and you transfer them over to another route and that way um, you know the folks were getting a constant supply of uh, changing horses um, and such. Here is, this is one of my favorite pictures, this is a woman who is delivering her materials not on horseback but on foot. Okay, on foot. And you can see here, she's traveling along a fence line, right? A sort of a roadway along a fence line. She happens to have an old briefcase full of books in, uh, you know, a satchel around her here. And she also has got uh, newspapers and books stacked up over here in her uh, arm as well. And that's how she's going out to give her books uh, out on the route. The women like this other woman here who used horses, these women would rent the horses from local farmers. Um, so you could rent a good horse for about 50 cents a week. And again, this was a situation where the money had to come out of this woman's paycheck because there was no uh, funding for, for the bags, for the horses, for any of that stuff. So this woman would take her 50 cents and she would uh, rent this horse for a month, from a, uh, for a week, sorry, for, uh, from a local farmer. And she would go out on her roots that way. She was making um, you know, the money because she had the job as the pack horse librarian. The folks were getting the books out in the hinterland and um, the local farmer was making um, some money uh, by renting out uh, his horse as well. Now, one of the things you might notice about these pictures is um, these women look pretty well dressed, right? Like, you know, they're, uh, she's got this nice collared outfit on here. She's got her, her nice hat, you know, and she's looking pretty good. Um, same thing with this woman over here, even though she's out walking, she's got her nice hat on here and she's got her nice shoes and her nice dress. That's not usually the way they looked. Um, there was a, uh, an effort made to document what these women were doing. And so they got a photographer out there and they let the women know, hey, next Tuesday, we're gonna photograph you guys, you know, um, just to sort of do a couple stories about you. And so the women were like, oh, well, I'm gonna get all spiffed up. So they wore their best stuff that particular day. So that's why they happened to be looking so good um, in those uh, in those photographs, sometimes they had uh, what were called penny drives, and this uh, was a form of a fundraiser. Um, so that if they weren't getting enough collections of books, um, they would uh, collect these pennies, and then they were able to buy uh, books um, and supplies, like you know pencils and, and things for the you know the. Uh, the uh, card catalog um, and index cards and those sorts of things, um, they were able to buy those with some of the money that they made through these, um, these penny uh, donations. Often these penny, uh, these penny drives were run by a local PTA because these women not only gave books to farmers and folks out in the hinterland, 
They also came to be depended upon by the local school districts uh, to help distribute reading material and books uh, for the children uh, there as well. Remember, it was hard times, so people were making uh, do with what they could. And um, you know, if the pack horse librarians could, you know, supply books to, to to schools, or if the schools that maybe weren't having quite as much attendance because you know the kids were needed on the farm. Um, they might donate their textbooks to be used and transported around uh, through the Pack Horse librarians um, uh, as well. One Penny Drive was notable. It raised a whopping $52, right? That's enough to pay two Pack Horse women um, for a month. And then in Lee County, there was a, uh, a pie supper, um, and they raised $18.50. And in Jackson County, a play was written um, called uh, um, Go Slow Mary, and it was about the local Pack Horse librarian. And um, she was so popular and so beloved that when the play went on, they were able to raise $17.25. Periodically, newspaper articles were written about these women, and um, from 1930, from November 1st, 1936 to March 4th, 1937, um, there was a, a series of articles that were written uh, about these women that appeared all over um, the country. And as a result of that, 2,351 books, 11,433 periodicals um, were received uh, from 18 states uh, across the union to help um, you know, uh, supply these books for these pack horse um, librarians. Um, by 1937, um, it's estimated that 60,000 books were in circulation and 155 public schools were being served and about 26,000 families. Now these numbers are approximate um, because, you know, again, if you're, you're keeping your records in, a, in an old cheese box, um, you know, it's, it's hard to get, you know, you know, super good records. But nonetheless, there were, um, you know, a, a lot of people being served, um, you know, uh, 26,000 families that equates out to about 1.5, um, you know, million people, um, you know, through the school districts and that sort of thing as well. Um, we talked about what books were popular, classics, picture books, um, and of course, the, um, the, uh, the scrapbooks and such. Now, by 1943, um, demands for the uh, for the um, uh, that were coming in uh, because of World War II, right? As we were getting ready to um, to uh, you know, we actually were in World War II by that point. But you know, as the demands uh, became harder and uh, more pressing, um, the Pack Horse Librarian Program was finally um, terminated, and there were about uh, a thousand uh, women that were participating in this about 200 at a time. Um, so a thousand women circulated through the program um, from 35 to uh, 1943, earning $28 a month, traveling sometimes 18 to 20 miles, sometimes 25 miles a day on horseback or foot, uh, delivering books to people who needed to have books out uh, in, the, uh, in the hinterland. Um, this was an important program because uh, for a lot of reasons. Number one is it gave women a job, right? And women, um, you know, as as so often is the case, uh, tended to be forgotten um, when it came time for these WPA jobs and that sort of thing. So this was a wonderful opportunity to bring in an underserved and an underused uh, cohort of people, women, to give them jobs to help support their families uh, during the Great Depression. The Pack Horse Librarian Program also promoted literacy. And Franklin Roosevelt believed this was very, very important. How can you find a job if you can't find a job, if you can't read a, a job uh, announcement or can't fill out a job application? So the ability to have these programs that allowed people to have access to reading materials and improve their reading skills and improve their literacy, um, Roosevelt believed was an important thing um, to help uh, end poverty and help end, um, you know, uh, the Great Depression. Um, it made finding a job easier. It made keeping a job easier. These pack horse librarians also promoted a sense of community. 
And this was really important because you were using these local women to go out to these areas, to bring these books, letting these folks know out there in the hinterland they weren't forgotten, that the world was still going on, um, that there were interesting things going on in the world, and that there were people who were interested, the federal government by paying these women's salaries, and people in the, um, you know, the villages and towns um, who were collecting these books, repairing the books, making the, the bookmarks, and sending these things out. So it gave sen people a sense of connection, right? And I think this past year has certainly shown us how important um, that actually is. It also made um, the, the folks out in the hinterland less susceptible to snake oil salesmen and people trying to pull the wool over their eyes, right? Because the broader the view of the world that they got, um, you know, the less, uh, you know, gullible they tended to be, um, you know, and, and they sort of began to learn some of the ways of the world. Keep in mind, there was no television, there was radio, but whether these people had it um, is doubtful, right? There wasn't a lot of electricity, you know, rural electrification was coming, but it wasn't always uh, there in time. And so, by reading, you were able, you were able to connect to the rest of, of the world. And Roosevelt also believed the ability to read, the ability to um, be exposed to ideas, <clears throat> the ability to see what was going on in the outside world, the ability to create critical thinking skills. Right. By reading something and saying, well, I don't know, you know, I read something else that said this and that. And then being able to make those decisions ultimately promoted democracy. And that was very, very important, especially once the war came on and we were fighting, you know, fascists and Nazis and, you know, folks like that. The need to keep democracy strong, the need to keep um, a sense of community strong, the need to address the needs of people who were unconnected, super duper important. And all of this was a partnership for $28 uh, a month for these women um, provided by the federal government, but the community picking up the rest of the components, supplying the women, the women um, you know, supplying the, the bags, uh, the community supplying the books, the local farmers supplying um, the, the horses and such. And it was an example, once again, of local folks feeling involved, local folks being involved, and local folks getting just that little help out from the government um, in a win-win situation, which is what Roosevelt was always looking for with these programs. How do we help as many people as we can get through these difficult times as we can? And we understand they can't do it themselves. We will give them some resources to be able to do it. And one of the things that I love so much about these Pack Horse Librarians is it speaks to the, um, the, the, the spirit of local libraries, right? Local libraries are still with us today. They're out there, you know, many people thought they were gonna go away when the internet came along. Who's gonna need a book if you can look everything up on a screen? And yet what these local libraries have done is they've reinvented themselves as sort of mini um, community centers, you know, by offering programs, by offering speakers, by offering, you know, uh, sometimes daycare uh, services or children's hours and those sorts of things. These librarians have, have always found a way to to, uh, reinvent themselves, to make um, their resources available to the people who were really, really uh, in need. And it's one of my favorite uh, New Deal programs, one that not a lot of people know about, but um, certainly an important one and certainly one that served a lot of people. Now in 1943, the program sort of disbanded because again, the pressures of the war. And um, there, the idea was picked up again in the 1950s uh, with bookmobiles um, in various cities and such. And this was a program that was sort of piloted there in Paintsville, uh, Kentucky. But as these newspaper articles were getting out about what they were doing, this did occur, uh, begin to occur in other places um, uh, in the country, but it was these uh, two, this this particular program uh, in the southeastern part of Kentucky that was um, that was sort of the inspiration and the one that sort of caught the imagination of what pack horse librarians uh, were able um, to do. So let's take a look at what we got over here in the chat. If you have any questions or or comments. Here's one. Helen says, "I recently read the book Women of Trouble Creek." 
by Kim Michelle Richardson, um, sent to me by a friend from Arizona. And that's great. Yeah, that's a wonderful book. Um, and that came out a couple of years ago. It's a great book, talks about the Pack Horse Librarians. Um, and it's a wonderful way to get a sense of um, you know, what was going on in that part of the uh, in that part of the country. There was another book that came out about six months later called The Giver of Stars uh, by Jojo Moyes. Um, and that's another one that, that talks about um, the work of the, the Pack Horse Librarians. Did some of the Pack Horse Librarian programs continue operating through the use of local funds after the federal uh, program was discouraged? Sometimes you were able to find a rich benefactor that, that might be able to you know, toss a couple pennies um, you know, uh, your way and such. But by the time the war really started to um, you know, demand uh, more and more attention. Uh, that's really where the focus was. The focus was then on, um, you know, making sure that everything went into the war effort. So, you know, many of the books, many of the um, the uh, scrapbooks and things, you know, were converted into scrap paper uh, for the war effort and that sort of thing. So that sort of took the the focus, um, you know, uh, at uh, at that point. Um, but what was, what was very interesting as a result of this Pack Horse Librarian program is that when some of these, you know, these boys were drafted and had to go into the military and they needed to learn how to be soldiers and they needed to learn how to use equipment, they had the reading skills to be able to read the training man manuals to be able to do that, in part because of the ability uh, to read through the Pack Horse Librarian uh, program. Let's see. Okie dokie. All righty. Do, do, do. My grandmother had so many National Geographics in her house. Yeah, National Geographics are awesome because, like I say, you can, you know, you can pick up one from 15 years ago and it's speaking about, it's talking about something that, um, you know, obviously time changes and things happen and, and you know, there's, there's, there's going to be more updated information and material, but it gives you a great background on, and they're so detailed and they're so well written and involved. It's, it's wonderful to be able to, um, to take a look at those. Let's see. What else do we have here? Let's see. Uh, I'm looking for an anecdote from someone who a librarian then, especially if they met Eleanor. Boy, that's a that's a good question. You know, um, these unfortunately, you know, these women were not. Um, I mean, they did get a little bit of publicity. You know, in in terms of when these writers came in and wrote about them, and then these letters appeared uh, in newspapers and such. But in in large measure, they're a sort of forgotten corner of of the New Deal and a forgotten corner uh, of the Great Depression. So I don't know. And there's only about a thousand of them all together over the course of the you know eight or nine years that the program was around. I don't know if any of them ever actually met um, Eleanor Roosevelt, but I do know she was a huge fan of the, of the program and really believed in. Um, and getting those women those jobs and getting those people um, their uh, those books. Here's someone who says, dog-eared pages in any book that isn't yours ought to be illegal. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree. Especially again with the, you know, with the, my daughter does karaoke and it's just annoying to try to pick up a book and do that. So I totally agree with you. Use a bookmark, right? You know, how hard could that be? Um, <laughs> let's see here. Joining you from Eastern Kentucky today, I had, I remember my great aunt talking about the Pack Horse Librarian. So cool to get to learn more about it. Wow, thanks for joining us from Eastern Kentucky. I A lot of great things have come out of Kentucky, um, uh, and a lot of good things, and a lot of pretty good things have come out of Kentucky, and I'm one of them. Um, I was born in Lexington. Woohoo! So nice to hear from you. Um, thank you for, for putting that in there. Um, Deanna says, my kind of women. Absolutely, right? You know, these these guys just went out there and there's stories about women who um, they would ride through the, the creeks and things. And by the time they got to the farm, um, they couldn't get out of their their, sir, their stirrups because the, the, the creek would splash up on their legs and their boots would freeze in the stirrups. So they had to kind of jiggle and wiggle, um, you know, to get out. But the, the folks that were waiting for these books depended on them and they understood that and they needed to get those books to folks um you know so important so important for all those reasons we we you know mentioned you know democracy community literacy all those uh, sorts of, of things all right let's see if there's anything else in here uh let's see <laughs> 
Okay. All right, that looks like about it for um, for the uh, the questions and such. So my advice to you would be this. You know, um, why don't you go visit your local library? Um, maybe it's been a while since you've been there. And, you know, get in there and let them know that um, you appreciate what they're doing. And let them know that, uh, you know, that the work that they do, the ways that they find to reach folks out in the community um, is really having an impact. You know, sometimes we don't, you know, hug our local librarian. And don't do it during the pandemic. But, you um, you know, sometimes we don't, you know, hug our, our local librarians enough and let them know that, um, you know, th that they're so important to us. They are the kind of things, these little local libraries, that you may walk by every single day and never think about it, but you will if it goes away. Then you'll miss it. So, um, you know, keep that in, in mind as well. So that's all the time we have for today, and we will see you again uh, sometime soon. Um, it's been my pleasure to present to, for you today about this really kind of cool little group of, of folks um, who did such an incredible service uh, during the, the uh, Great Depression. So we'll see you again sometime soon. Take care in the meantime and have fun and, um, you know, get your, get your local library. And no dog earring.